<laughs> Good morning. Welcome all to all of you. Aloha kako. Uh, my name is Benadine Stone. On behalf of the State of Hawaii Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, the Real Estate Commission, um, we welcome you um, to this joint event with the Community Associations Institute Hawaii. Please speak up. Is this better? Yes. Okay, thanks. We welcome you to this joint event um, sponsored by the Real Estate Commission and the Community Associations Institute Hawaii. This program today, the Condorama, is chaired by Milton Motooka, who is also the chair of CAI Hawaii Programs Committee. Um, we have a panel of professionals this morning who, um, like you, have given up their Saturday to condominium education. And we appreciate that and thank you for coming and we thank the panel for um, sharing their knowledge with us. With this, I'll turn it over to Milton Motooka, the chair of the event, and he'll um, talk about the panel and um, describe the uh, schedule for this morning. Again, mahalo for coming. Thank you, Benedine. On behalf of the Hawaii chapter of CAI, I would like to welcome all of you to this program and we're pleased to be presenting this program together with the Real Estate Commission. Uh, I'm program's co-chair for CAI. Um, how many of you have attended a CAI program? May I see your hands? Okay, um, thank you. CAI is celebrating its 32nd year right now. Uh, so we've been in existence for a while and um, I'm one of the co-founders of the chapter. In 1990, the Real Estate Commission uh, basically contracted with CAI to put on the very first education seminar. And we did it in conjunction with the um, National Conference of CAI and we held the program at the Hilton Hawaiian Village where the conference was. The program then was called Condorama and I was the chair of that program. We drew 800 plus people to that program. It was the largest um, attended seminar in CAI's history up to that point in time. So we were very pleased with that. So when we were asked to work with the commission to put on this program today, I thought it would be appropriate to resurrect the concept of Condorama. And so Condorama is basically a program that we would like to provide different topics that are important for you to understand the operation of condominiums to assist you as owners, as directors, as managers, etc. cetera. Um, I think, you know, we're very pleased that you gave up your Saturday morning to come here um, and we hope that it's worth your while and you find the information helpful. Uh, may I find out the audience mix? How many of you are condominium owners? May I see your hands? Okay, how many of you are on the board of those condominiums? How many of you are property managers? Okay, uh, site managers, any? Um, do we have any representatives from the Real Estate Commission other than the people checking you in outside? Do we have any politicians in the crowd? Okay, that's important because we take our shots at politicians and I wanna know if, if how many people I'm offending. Um, do we have any fans of President Trump in the audience? <laughs> okay, well, I will offend you then, but anyway, it's in the interest of humor, so. Uh, a few housekeeping details. The restrooms, you go out the door, take a left, and there's a sign marked restrooms, so you can go there. On the right, there's a hallway that you can go down and look for the restrooms, but it's a little bit more convoluted. So I would suggest going to the left. At this time, I would ask that you please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. We would also ask that during the presentation, you not chat with your owner because that's usually disturbing to the neighbors. This seminar is funded entirely by the Condominium Education Fund Real Estate Commission for condominium apartment owners whose associations are currently registered with the Real Estate Commission. The booklet that you got when you checked in, I would ask that you pull it out now. 
That booklet has the seminar materials of each speaker in the order of presentation, so you can use it to take notes. In the booklet was also a sheet of paper to, add, to write questions down, so if any questions pop up in your mind, go ahead, jot it down, and we will have a Q&A portion at the end of the program. During the program in chief, the speakers will not take questions. We will handle that during the Q&A portion. If we run out of time, the speakers have um, basically all agreed that we will stay after and we will answer any questions that you have. So if your question wasn't answered, uh, you can get it answered after the seminar is over. At this time, what I'd like to do is um, introduce the speakers in order of presentation. And Jane Sugimura always comes in with a flourish, and there she is now. <laughs> the first speaker today is John Morris. John is a partner of Ekimoto and Morris. He first became involved with condos and homeowner associations when he served for three years as the very first condominium specialist for the state of Hawaii. He has spoken and written numerous articles uh, about homeowner associations and legislation affecting them. He is the author of the Director's Guide to Hawaii Community Association, Association Law. Uh, this is a great handbook that is referred to by property managers, um, owners, attorneys. It's just a, a very well done reference book. Um, John also has been active in legislation throughout his years, and he's very well versed in what goes on at the legislature. Following uh, John will be Jane Sugimura, who walked in now. Um, she's a partner in the firm of Mendet, Fidel, and Sugimura, and has been practicing since 1978. She is president of the Hawaii Council of Association of Apartment Owners, and has served as its president since 1994. So I guess you don't have term limits in that organization. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, she has been actively involved in legislation affecting condominiums, um, both with the legislature and the city council. Ms. Sugimura has served um, on the Bougainville board and the Pearl One board and was the president in 2013. She has also served on numerous task forces involved in condominium um, association issues and as on the Blue Ribbon Recodification Advisory Committee, which assisted in the drafting of 514B. Following Jane will be Kevin Whalen. He is the Vice President of Touchstone Properties and has been in the community association management industry for 13 years. He is the past president of CAI, Hawaii chapter. He holds the certified manager of community associations um, designation and the prestigious professional community association manager, the PCAM uh, given by CAI. He was awarded the CAI uh, Committee Chair of the Year in 2015, and last year he was awarded with the Richard M. Gordy Distinguished Service Award, which is the highest award the, the chapter gives out. Following Kevin, I will speak on effective rulemaking. The final speaker of the day is Sue Savio. Sue is the president and owner of Insurance Associates since 1975. Insurance Associates specializes in providing insurance services for condominiums, cooperatives, and homeowner associations and similar developments. Um, her company now insures more than 1,000 community associations throughout the state. So by far, she is the um, biggest insurance agent in the state. Um, people rely on her for information. She is tireless, we're the same age, but I look, of course, 30 years older. Um, but she gets in the office, be, usually before five, and she's there till seven, and she just has boundless, boundless energy. Um, she was also awarded with the Richard M. Gorley Distinguished Service Award for her service in the insurance industry. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to John Morris. Uh, 
So as Milton mentioned, mine are the first materials in the, in the handout. And we're talking rights and duties of condominium directors, and the first issue is fiduciary duty. And if you forget all the rest of what we talk about today, if you turn to the last page of my materials, page seven, this is a section out of the law which deals with fiduciary duty and the responsibilities of directors. And it's a reference to the nonprofit law. And it says, what are directors supposed to do? They're supposed to act in good faith with the care an ordinary person would exercise in a manner they reasonably believe to be in the best interest of the corporation. And then in doing that, subsection B, they're entitled to rely on certain things. So if you forget what, just remember section 414D 149 because it's like a little road map of things you should know as a director. What should you be trying to do? And you should probably notice subsection C of that section, a director is not acting in good faith if the director has knowledge concerning the matter in question that makes reliance by the director unwarranted. So for example, if you're relying on your brother-in-law to undertake some very difficult renovation at the project and he knows nothing, you can't turn around and say, well, I should be protected because I relied on my brother-in-law. You have to be able to reasonably rely. So to expand a little bit on that, the fiduciary duty is imposed on you as a director because you're acting for other people. And part of what you're supposed to be, I've summarized really what is said in 414 D 149, diligence, you're supposed to, your, your fiduciary duty includes duty of diligence, act as a reasonably prudent person, good faith. This is the um, empty head, pure heart. You may not know what you're doing, but as long as you're doing your best with no hidden agenda, that's good faith. Loyalty, you're not supposed to be using your position on the board to make things better for yourself, particularly if it's at the expense of um, your fellow owners, and then obedience. If the President of the United States doesn't get to do whatever he wants, neither do you. So you have to read the documents. You have to know what your authority is. It is often very broad, that's true, but it isn't unlimited. So be aware of those four basic principles, diligence, good faith, loyalty, and obedience. There's also something called the business judgment rule, which you will often hear referred to, and I've never quite worked out whether that's supposed to be the same as your fiduciary duty or something different. But it's a similar analysis, and really, it, I think the focus in the business judgment rule is more when you are doing business-like things, entering into contracts and that sort of thing. Fiduciary duty seems to be more something you would be um, subject to when you're acting for your owners in dealing with the owners and dealing with non-business activities. But the business judgment rule is very similar, how an ordinary prudent person would act in the same circumstances. It's supposed to be if you're behaving reasonably and in good faith. There's Hawaii case law on that, which says that's what the business judgment rule means, that the director or officer acted reasonably and in good faith. And I've summarized bottom of page one, top of page two, what that would involve, which is keep informed, um, attend and participate in meetings. You shouldn't sign up for the board if you're gonna stay home and watch TV. Make sure your absences and objections, if you don't think the board's doing what it should, which can happen, you should try and make sure that that's recorded in the minutes act in the best interests of all owners and avoid conflicts, not exceed your authority, act in a timely manner. So what it really comes down to is like mathematics, you get more credit for doing what you're supposed to do even if you get the wrong answer because that's what the courts will look at. Did you follow these steps? Did you just shoot from the hip or did you do a careful, systematic analysis of what you're supposed to be doing? And so that's the next section, the importance of procedural requirements. So you should be, you don't necessarily just wanna make a good decision, you wanna be able to prove to people that you did make a good decision, 
by laying out the groundwork to show that you did what you should have done. And so that's one of the things you should keep in mind because you're almost bound to screw up if you're on the board at some time. But again, just like mathematics, you get the wrong answer, but you did it in the right way, you will get credit for the procedure even if you get the wrong answer. So records, I mentioned here records, that's usually quite important. Make sure if you're voting on something as a board member that you include your vote. If you're objecting, certainly you should do that. You should try and record. If you're hiring a contractor, you might want to put in your minutes that you reviewed proposals from X, Y, and Z contractors. This shows that you did something carefully and thoroughly. If you're not at a board meeting and you look at the minutes, you should probably make sure that's not um, something that you, it should be reflected in the minutes. And then don't say stupid things in public. Don't say we don't want any of these people in, that's what happened to Donald Trump. He said all those stupid things before the campaign. Now he's doing things he probably could do anyway, but the judge is saying, oh no, because you said all those stupid things before, I'm going to question your motives in this. And that's what can happen to you. If you say we don't like somebody and then you end up legitimately taking action against them, that will come back to haunt you because that's what they will look at. Employees, you should be trying to keep some eye on employees, although your managing agent should do a lot of that for you. But ultimately, as a board member, you are responsible for what they do. So if they're going off the rails, you should try and make sure that you bring them back or if you have to, find someone else to do their job. Contracts. The most common question we get as attorneys is how do we get out of this contract we signed? Because they don't want to spend the money to at least have us point out some of the problems. And then they sign up and then they find out there's a 500 year rollover clause or something like that. They can never escape. And then they say, how do we get out of this? So it might be better if you're on the board. And again, it's a form of insurance, not just attorneys, architects, engineers. If you consult them, it's a form of insurance. You can say, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I did ask this architect, this engineer, and I took their advice. That is a form of insurance for you as board members, because if you try and make decisions where you have no expertise, no knowledge, you're not going to meet that requirement that we talked about in section 149. Keep records of owner problems and violations. Sometimes we see where the owner does stuff for six months, nobody writes it down. Finally, the board gets fed up. They have one citation and they say, we want you to take legal action against this owner. And we say, well, what have they done? And they say, well, here's the citation. We say, one citation, say, oh no, this has been going on for six months. We say, well, where are the other citations? And there aren't any. So it's important to keep those kind of records. Page three, you'll see some others. Um, financial controls, sometimes that can be a problem. I've seen that happen. Higher license contractors don't, usually when you're a board member and you try and cheap it out, there's really two rules, do a good job, and number two is protect yourself from unnecessary liability. The problem you have when you cheap it out and get an unlicensed contractor is if they screw up, it's going to be worse for you. And what you did is you saved everybody money at the expense of raising your own personal liability. So what's the point? Why would you do that? Consult experts, we talked about that. Keep written records of important actions not covered in the minutes. And then Jane is going to cover this, but um, I just have a little bit about owners. Owners have to think in similar terms. If they're going to complain about what the board did and they complain verbally for six months and then suddenly fly off the handle, they don't have any record that they even told the board what they were concerned about. Second thing you should think about, due process. This is fundamental in the US, maybe not everywhere, but it's supposed to be things like the punishment should fit the crime, so don't find somebody $500 for leaving their slippers outside the door and expect the judge to agree with you. And then before someone's penalized, they're supposed to give notice and an opportunity to be heard, even if it doesn't say that in your documents. This due process principle is hovering above you at all times, and that's what judges like to see. That if you're going to be mean to someone, you did it in a careful, fair, and systematic manner. And it's the same. 
people in similar circumstances. The president can't park in the guest parking and then say, well, none of the other owners can do this. You have to treat similarly situated people similarly unless you can show legal or factual reasons why you shouldn't. So I just put at the bottom of page three, when you're looking at this due process, do you have the power to act? Check the Deccan bylaws. They may not say you can do what you want to do. Was the procedure for your rule reasonable? Is the content of the rule reasonable? Is the rule applied reasonably? And Milton's going to go into this in detail, so just a, a brief s summary of that. Uh, let's see. Oh, penalties for rule violations. I think that maybe will be something Milton's covering, but you should be very clear on what the penalty is, and you should make sure that you communicate that to the person you're going to penalize, but I think Milton will cover that. Collections. This is something you have to be careful on. You want to be making sure that you have a nice, well-communicated procedure to the owners because otherwise they will probably complain that they weren't given the right notice. You should remember the law says when you increase the maintenance fees, you have to give 30 days notice. But again, Milton will cover, I think, some of this. Self-help. A lot of boards think, well, why don't we just take that old refrigerator out of there, off their lanai, and throw it in the garbage, and that will be done. It's not a good thing to exercise self-help unless it's very clear what you're doing, because that is basically what the court system is there to prevent. Instead of people taking the law into their own hands, which is essentially what self-help is, the court system is there to um, have an adjudication of whether that action is justified. So if you are going to exercise self-help, just put a little asterisk saying, I should be very careful about doing this because it can come back to bite you. You throw away the old refrigerator and the owner says, that was a $300 refrigerator, give me the $300. Bottom of page four, public relations. This is something that um, when I was a state condo specialist, it was always astounding to me. So you, you are a politician when you're on the board. It isn't all just the law, it is politics. So you have to have some kind of bedside manner. You can't just say, legally, you probably can tell people, well, we don't have to listen to you. This is a board responsibility. But we don't care what you think, which is probably true and may actually be actionable. I mean, you don't necessarily have to care what they think because if it's your job, you get to make the decision. But if you tell people that, it just upsets them. So it's not usually a good idea to tell people the truth in this area that by electing us, you gave up 95% of the control of your life because they don't want to hear that. So you should be thinking in terms of your bedside manner as a director because that can backfire. People will get so annoyed, they will run against you. They will try and remove you. So remember, you're not just a legal person. You are a politician. And of course, the same is true of owners, which Jane, if you go in and yell and scream at board members, you're probably not going to get things that you might if you went in a little more carefully and politely. And it may be my English upbringing, but I find it extremely offensive when board members or owners are offensive to each other. It's just so unnecessary. So I think that's something to keep in mind because that's what sets people off. They will be gunning for you because you cut them down at an annual meeting five years ago and they feel it was unfair. And they'll be looking for things, violations to use against you. So Keep in mind, being on the board, you are a politician. Communications, let people know what you're doing. I remember years ago when I was a condo specialist, some guy on the top floor, he kept getting leaks in his unit. The board was working on fixing the roof. They were doing all this stuff. They had a contractor ready to go. And finally, there was a big rain. The guy's unit flooded. He went out and got an attorney and sued them. And he said, they said, well, no, we were working on this. And he said, well, nobody ever told me. So if you're doing something to help an owner with their problem, at least let them know you're doing something because that's often the case. You know what's going on, but don't assume that the people you're trying to help or deal with know what's going on. So this is important. Communicate what you're doing, maybe newsletters, websites, but give people some idea of the problem because it's not, you are all in it together. They like to think that somehow you're removed and you're making these decisions that affect them and they don't affect you and you have to communicate that 
as well, that we're all going down on the sinking ship unless we do something to prevent that, and it's your part of it and I'm part of it. Planning ahead, you are supposed to have reserves. That's been the law since 1991. If you don't have adequate reserves, you could have problems. Policies, if you're going to have a policy on collections or almost anything. I had a case once where we had a, a dispute about insurance and about who should pay for a um, damage caused by a leaking pipe. And the board, after this issue arose, the board adopted a policy saying this would be the owner's responsibility. We went into the judge and the judge said, yes, that's very nice, but you adopted it after the problem arose, so it's not going to count. Know what you're doing. Education. Milton mentioned CAI does seminars on a regular basis. You should try to do to at least know what you're doing, get some idea of what you're doing. And it's good that you came today. That's a good sign that you took the time. You could be doing something else to try and find out more of what you're supposed to do as a director. So that is always, I think, worthwhile. And you can, and this is, some owners resent this, but why would an owner have to, I mean, why would a board member have to pay for their own training when it's for the, the betterment of the whole association? So I think that's very worthwhile. And I think if you have the chance, you should get the CAI and other organizations' outlines and try and attend some of their seminars. Do something. This is very important. There are, there are cases saying sitting there and doing nothing when you know something should be done is not going to help you. If you do nothing as a board member, it should be because you investigated everything carefully and decided that nothing was the right thing to do. But it shouldn't just be because you're paralyzed by fear that the owners will attack you for raising a big special assessment or something like that. You are supposed to do something. When you, it's not just going to board meetings and discussing things. It's doing what has to be done. So that's one of the things. And again, as I say, do not cheap it out. If you're a board member, nine times out of ten, when you're saving money for the association, you're doing that at the expense of your own personal potential liability. Chunks of concrete falling off the building, all that sort of stuff. And then the final thing to remember as a board member is self-governance. This is what I would tell people all the time. Owners would call in when I was a condo specialist to bitch about their boards, and I'd say, I'm really sorry, but except in very limited areas, the Real Estate Commission is not responsible for seeing that your building is run correctly, it is you. So that's why as a board member you should be aware of this theory because that underlies everything that's going on in the law. There have been attempts to get some state official who will come in and slap board members around and make them do the right thing, but that would be an overwhelming task for the state. So I think that's something you have to remember. When owners ask for records, when they criticize what you're doing, that is actually part of their job, and I think Jane will explain that to you now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to... Uh I want to congratulate and thank you for coming this morning uh, because uh, it's very important uh, for you to uh, educate yourself as to your rights and obligations as a unit owner and as a board member. And my topic this morning is to talk about owner's obligations and uh, rights. And that starts when you buy the unit. And unfortunately, many unit owners do not get involved until they run into a problem with the board or the site manager or you know they, they run into a problem. They should become involved with the association. They are a member after all. If, you know, when, once that you buy a unit, you are a member of the association. So one of your obligations is to be an active participant. That means that uh, you need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, be familiar with how the organization works. You should be attending board meetings and the annual meetings. And when the elections occur, you should uh, look into the candidates and, and try to find the best person to represent your interests, or maybe you should run for the board. Uh, as John says, you know, when, when you vote for somebody, 
to be on the board, you are giving up your rights to do, because you're telling that person that you trust them to manage the building. Because under the law, and the law in this case is chapter 514B, and there are two statutes, 514A and 514B. But there is legislation pending, and we really think 514A is going away. So for all intents and purposes, I'm, when I say the statute, I'm gonna refer to 514B. That's the condo statute. And the organization that's putting on this seminar today, the Real Estate Commission, as part of the state of Hawaii, DCCA, they have a website. And I believe the last time I looked, 514B was on their website. And so if you don't have access you know, to a, uh, you know, the, the Hawaii Revised Statutes, you could probably go to your library and do it, but you could go online and they, it is on their website. And that is the statute that everything kind of is tied to. But I want to emphasize the fact that you know, when, when you buy into a condominium, you become a member of the association, that's when your rights and obligations begin. And uh, to fully participate, you need to take advantage and participate. And you also, uh, one of the, uh, the pr primary obligations is, is to pay your maintenance fees, to make sure that there's sufficient cash flow so that the building can operate. And um, another obligation is to comply, oh, and with the meetings, attending the meetings. There's pending legislation now to clarify that as a member of the association, you are entitled to speak at the board meetings. Right now, there are some board, boards that have rules that say, oh well, you can only speak at the owner's forum, or we're gonna pass a resolution, or we're gonna take a vote now, and we're not gonna let you speak. That is not permitted. Under the current law, that's not permitted. Under the law that's pending and moving through the legislature, and we think it's gonna pass out, it clarifies that as an owner, you have a right to speak. So you can raise your hand at that board meeting, ask a question, and provide input. But you're subject to the board president who has an agenda. Okay, the, the uh, board has an agenda, they have to get through it. And so they can't take 30 minutes out of their agenda to deal with your issue. Okay, so, but, they, but you have a right to speak. And if it, it's gonna take longer than you know, a few minutes, that's something you might want to talk to the board members with afterwards. But you know, uh, right now, under the current law, you are allowed to, to attend board meetings, you are allowed to speak at those board meetings. And if they tell you you can't speak, they're wrong. And there is a, a law pending now that clarifies that very point. Um, okay, I was going down this, the list that uh, is in my handout. Uh, you need to comply with the condo declaration bylaws, house rules, and other rules and regulations. It's really important. I mean, rules are there so that um, everybody will act in a way uh, to make living in this building uh, acceptable. And you as an owner have input. When it, house rules are amended, or let, let's say you don't like a house rule, you can ask for the house rule to be amended. You can ask for the declaration to be amended or the bylaws to be amended. And if there's enough people who agree with you, you can do that. Because the statute says that 67% uh, of the owners can change um, the bylaws. And so there is a process and it's in the statute. So you can do it. And uh, if you uh, want to do it, you can co contact the condo specialist. They will point you to the provision in the law that allows you to do that. And you, if you want to change the house rule or you want to add a house rule, talk to your board member. And, and they can uh, implement that. And one of the uh, really important things that you have to do is to maintain your unit and cooperate with building inspections. In fact, in this, uh, uh, when we amended uh, 514B, we ended added uh, something called the high-risk components. You know, things like the washing machine hoses that kind of break and cause water to go you know, down several floors. And, uh, and the, the P-valve in the, in, the, in the kitchen sink and things like that. This provision in the statute allows the condominium association to do an annual inspection. And usually, it, it just means that you have to take maybe an hour out of your life once a year or have somebody in your unit 
so that when they come by, you can let them in and they can do the inspection. Doesn't cost you anything, and usually they will give you a list of things that they found wrong in your unit that you can repair so that, um, you know, the, so that there is no incident that would cause water damage to your unit or some other unit. And in some cases, the building will make those repairs for free. And uh, that is a very, very important provision. And I can tell you, uh, we had an incident in our building where we had one unit owner who absolutely refused to allow us in. And so uh, it took us a while, it was a challenge. And we pointed to the statue, and we persuaded that unit owner that it was in his best interest to allow us to go in and inspect his unit. And in fact, we did, and he claimed that, oh, he takes real good care of his unit, there's nothing wrong. But you know, we went in with the plumber, they found stuff wrong. And it cost them less than $10 to fix it, and I think he was grateful. But it did, it, it was a challenge. But you know, there, there is that statute now that allows the building to go in and, and, and do this inspection. And uh, it is part of the um, uh, overall repair and maintenance obligation of the board. And um, you want to be able to cooperate because what happens if you don't cooperate, then there might be a, you know, a water break and then it's gonna affect a bunch of units and, and it's a mess. And those of you who have you know, uh, been involved in, in, in a situation like that know, uh, you know what I'm talking about. One other I uh, issue that kind of ties in with this, we, about 10 years ago, we added an aging in place provision in the statute because there are a lot of uh, condominium owners who are aging and uh, they weren't able to take care of themselves. And some of them were like trust fund babies where the bank was paying their maintenance fees. And the, you say, well, why should the association be you know, concerned? Well, if they are hoarders, they don't take care of their units, you have cockroaches, you have, you know, and if they're hoarders, you've got newspapers stacked all the way to the ceiling, it's a fire hazard, it's dangerous. And, you know, so, you know, you have to have a way to deal with these issues. Uh, we went to the legislature, uh, they added, they agreed with us, they added a, uh, an aging in place provision. What it did is it allows the association to intervene uh, so, so, you know, that way uh, the association employees can intervene in a situation where there is somebody who's elderly or disabled who isn't able to take care of their unit and needs help. And for, and for those of you who are sitting here who may have family members or neighbors who are getting to that age, there are services in this town uh, that will help, you know, Catholic Charities, uh, the Salvation Army. They they have social workers who will go in and you know who will talk to the owners and provide them services, somebody to come in and clean, somebody to take them to doctor's appointments. And the whole purpose with aging in place is, if you're you're, you're getting older or you can't, you know, you're disabled, you can't take care of your unit. We we want you to be able to stay in your unit, but you have to get help. You have to get help because it affects your neighbors. It affects your neighbors if you can't, it, you know, you can't be hoarding, you can't be uh, not taking care of your unit because it causes health and safety issues that impact your owners. And you know, so, and in many cases, the association, you know, is is almost helpless. And what they can do under the aging in place statute is they can call one of these social service agencies, and they will pay for the social worker to assist the unit owner in getting these services. And what the association does is then they assess that unit owner uh, to pay for those uh, services. Uh, and and, and um, hopefully, you know, um, you know, we can uh, address, and this is not perfect. This is not a perfect solution, but at least it allows the association to intervene in a situation where you have an aging or a disabled owner who's not taking care of their unit and their uh, inability to do that is affecting other uh, uh, unit owners. Um, I wanna get now into uh, owner's rights. Oh, and, and in that uh, last bullet point in my handout, there is a typo. It says, do not do anything in your unit to allow conduct to occur in your unit that will interfere with your neighbor's use of their unit. Uh, and that's, you know, don't, 
make loud noises during quiet time, uh, don't smoke marijuana on the lanai, you know, these kinds of things. I mean, it seems like common sense, but you know, if everybody would uh, conduct themselves in a manner and think of their neighbors, both vertically and horizontally, as to you know, whether or not what they do uh, is going to affect them, then we would probably have, um, um, you know, we, we wouldn't have a whole lot of uh, contention in the buildings. And I, I included an article in uh, my handout, and, and what it does is it talks about, it talks about getting along. And I'm not going to go over it, but I suggest that you read it for board members and unit owners. About resolution of condo disputes or why we need to all get along. And this is a, a topic that you know I personally have you know been involved with for many many years. Um, if you don't get along, it's going to affect everybody. And this is for board members and for unit owners. Um, it costs you money because the board is going to get an attorney. And guess who pays for the, the attorney's fees? You do, through your maintenance fees. So the more disputes you have, the more the, uh, the association, the board members get their attorneys involved. You're paying for it. And uh, it affects the marketability of your unit. Because not a whole lot of people are going to want to buy into a building where you're fighting with your, your neighbors and maybe you are in lawsuits. And you ha as a seller, you have to disclose that to your prospective buyers. And there's no way that, uh, uh, that a knowledgeable buyer is gonna buy into a building where there's a lawsuit where the owner is suing the, the association or the board because naturally they don't wanna pay for the attorney's fees. I mean, why would you, you know, buy into a building where it's gonna cost you money? And so, you know, Dispute resolution has been a personal um, issue that I've been trying to deal with for many, many years. And so uh, that will probably come out in, in some of my comments. Um, under on owner's rights, the most important owner's right that you have is the right to elect and remove board members. And, and as John said, you know, when you elect a board member, you're giving up many rights because the, the, the declarations and the state law says that the board manages your unit. Once you vote them in, then you've, you've, ab, ab, you've given them the, ob, the right to do that. The statute and your bylaws and your declaration also re allow you to remove them. And so you have to get a certain amount, uh, uh, number of uh, uh, owners who think like you and you file a petition, you get a special election, you can remove those directors. But you have to act. And those rights are, are in your condo documents, they are in the uh, Hawaii law. Uh, one of the other uh, rights that you have as an owner is you have a right to documents and information so that you can make informed decisions about who to vote for, uh, to be your uh, uh, board members and um, uh, you know to make to inform you at, as to what you can say at uh, at your board meetings or your annual meetings when you decide to attend and um, there's a, a provision in 514b 514b-154 where all of the documents and information that you're entitled to get are there and so if you want to know things like what, what, what are you entitled to get, you are entitled to board minutes, you are entitled to financial records, you are entitled to contracts. And this session, there is a bill pending that says that an employment agreement for the resident manager, site manager, is a contract that an owner is entitled to obtain. And when you uh, ask for a con uh, uh, an employment agreement that the association cannot redact, compensation information or job description or duties. The only uh, information that can be redacted is information that is protected by state and federal privacy 
laws. Things like social security numbers, a personal cell phone number, the residential address, you know, those kinds of things. Things that you don't have any business knowing anyway. So uh, those things can be redacted. But things that you know, you might want to know about a resident manager or a site manager, you would be entitled to get. And right now, uh, I think, I mean, right now that bill is pending and we think it's going to pass out this session. Uh, and if so, then it's only a clarification because that the, the clarification is, is that that contract is, um, um, that contract, that, that employment agreement is a contract. And, um, Under fair housing, I just want to, I've been told that I've got a limitation, so I just want to quickly go through this. Under fair housing, uh, owners can request reasonable accommodations for physical or mental disability, and so you make a request to the board for that. The important thing I want to stress is if you have a dispute with your board, you can demand mediation uh, and arbitration. Mediation is uh, uh, you, you can, there's two types of mediation. Uh, one is uh, evaluative mediation, and, um, and that is uh, something that you can request, and uh, you pay for one hour of a mediator's time, and the state of Hawaii subsidizes the rest of the, the cost. And with arbitration, you can demand that under the statute, uh, and that one, there are two, two, two options. One is uh, you go through arbitration and, and after uh, uh, the arbitrator makes a decision, um, the, there is something called a de novo review. And if the losing party asks for de novo review, then they can do it all over again. But there is a bill pending this session that says that if both parties agree to binding arbitration, you pay for one hour of an arbitrator's time and the balance of the time, and, and, and usually the arbitrator is a retired judge, and um, the rest of the time is subsidized by the state of Hawaii. And you may feel that this, you may think that this is taxpayers' money, it's not. It's money that every owner in the state of Hawaii pays through your maintenance fees. For the last 20 years, you have been assessed I think it was started off a dollar and a quarter and now it's up to three dollars every other year. It goes into a fund collected by the DCCA Real Estate Commission. It's administered by the Real Estate Commission. It's called the Condo Education Fund. And that money uh, is used uh, to subsidize this dispute resolution. And I really encourage you to take advantage of it. There, is, there are bills pending now that make, it, and the statute says mandatory. But because both sides, the board and maybe the owners, have you know, found ways to get around that statute, the mandatory provision has not you know, been invoked, I mean, hasn't been enforced because there's nothing to enforce it. There is, bill, there is a bill pending now that would uh, uh, re require enforcement of the mandatory provision, which means that you know, if you, you uh, demand mediation or arbitration, they have to do it. And I've been told my time is up. I have one, one, one thing I wanna just mention. My organization has these YouTube videos. They're 28 minute videos. They're on Think Tech Hawaii. If you go on Google Think Tech Hawaii, they, we do weekly shows on all kinds of topics. We have all kinds of people that we interview that relate to condo issues. And you go to Think Tech Hawaii, look for Condo Insider. We have over 50 shows. Look at the playlist and it shows you what topic, foreclosure, what documents you can have, mediation, um, and, 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 and the experts are there with their telephone numbers that you can call and it's free. And you can look at it at any time you want to. You can look at it in the middle of the night. So please go there and enjoy. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me back there, TJ? Thank you. Um, so I am a property manager, and uh, part of my job as a property manager is that I get to do several reserve studies every year. So I will be covering reserves, 
what the law requires and why it is important. Um, reserves are extremely important because uh, poorly funded reserves can result in special assessments, large maintenance fee increases, and lower property values. So I'm going to be talking about how we can avoid that. And so today I will cover how to determine whether you have adequate reserves, reserve studies and the different components of reserve studies, what Hawaii law requires for reserve funding, and the benefits of having an accurate and well-funded reserve study. So uh, most condo associations have two funds that they, they use to uh, pay the bills. The, the first is the operating fund, and then there's the reserve fund. So we don't commingle the two. The operating fund is for the day-to-day -day operations, um, uh, for things such as employee payroll, uh, general maintenance, utilities, you know, the day-to-day -day things to run the property. The uh, reserve funds are designated for capital repairs. Now, the law uh, describes reserve funds as funds for the upkeep, repair, replacement of those parts of the property, including but not limited to roofs, walls, decks, paving, and equipment that the association is obligated to maintain. So again, we don't commingle the two. Um, how do you determine whether you have adequate reserves? Well, you perform a reserve study. A reserve study is a long-term capital budget planning tool. Essentially, a reserve study is an analysis of the association's physical assets and analysis of the association's uh, current uh, financial situation. So it tells you, here are the assets um, and the useful lives of everything that the association is required to maintain. And it looks at how much money you have in the bank. And it tells you, this is how much money you have, and therefore you should be putting this amount of money away in order to pay for all these projects when they come due. So uh, HRS 514B148 governs uh, budgets and reserve studies. And in the handouts, I, I put a couple of bullet points in there uh, straight from 148. It says, a budget shall include total replacement reserves as of the date of the budget. Uh, the budget shall include the estimated replacement reserves the association will require to maintain the property based on a reserve study performed by the association. So the association is required to perform a reserve study. It's right there in the law. A general explanation of how estimated replacement reserves are computed and whether computation was based on percent funded or cash flow plans. So a little later I will talk about the difference between percent funded and cash flow. Um, some examples of uh, components you'll see in a reserve study, um, uh, roofing, asphalt paving or seal coating, um, painting, a lot of times before you do painting, if you're in a wood structure, you got to do uh, wood repairs. If it's a concrete building, then there's uh, concrete spalls um, that need to be uh, repaired in conjunction or prior to painting. Window replacement is a big ticket item. Heat pumps, boilers, uh, chillers or cooling systems, elevators are a big ticket item, and plumbing. Um, Last month, I was at a CEI seminar, and the topic was aging buildings. And the presenter um, was saying that five to 10 years ago, we didn't see a line item for plumbing in our reserve studies. And, and that's totally true, because it, it, on the East Coast, uh, your cast iron waste lines will last 80 plus years. And so these buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s, we're now discovering that in Hawaii, we have maybe a 40-year lifespan on, on cast iron. And a lot of these associations weren't planning on that. They were thinking, oh, we got you know, lots of time left before we got to do the pipes. Well, uh, now today, because several buildings have had to go through uh, a plumbing replacement, um, some buildings, their insurance have told them that we're going to drop you if you don't you know, uh, do your pipes because they've had so many leaks. So now reserve studies should have a line item for uh, cast iron or galvanized pipe replacement and even uh, uh, copper line replacement. Uh, there's three main things you need uh, to determine for an accurate reserve study. Uh, the first is which components belong to the association. Uh, the second is when the components will need to be replaced or repaired. And the third is how much will it cost to uh, repair or replace these components. Uh, so the first part, how do you know which components belong to the association? Well, you look at your project documents. Your uh, declaration provides a description of the property. It provides a description of the common elements. It provides a description of the limited common elements, and it also describes the apartments. So based on the project documents, we're able to determine, OK, this is uh, the association's responsibility to uh, maintain and repair, so therefore this goes into the reserve study. Sometimes your project documents are silent on certain items. Uh, a, a very common one is windows. 
Windows is a huge ticket item. Um, in a high-rise building, Windows could cost millions of dollars, but sometimes your project documents don't clearly spell out Windows. So when we have these scenarios where things are silent, you definitely want to ask your condo attorney you know, to, to clarify things for you because you want to make sure that you have these things in the reserve study. And if it's not a common element and you know it's a big ticket item, it's definitely important for you to tell the owners, look, windows are not a common element and the windows in our building could be very expensive to replace. So you should be budgeting, you know, maybe this amount of money to replace your windows um, somewhere down the line. Um, sometimes limited common elements are not the association's responsibility to, uh, to pay for. Uh, some documents spell out that limited common elements are the responsibility uh, for a homeowner um, to pay for, and some project documents say a limited common element is the association's responsibility. So you definitely want to check that and make sure um, your reserve study uh, accurately reflects um, what your project documents say. And sometimes there are components in a building that are only utilized by a portion of the ownership. Uh, for instance, I know of a building that has a chiller system that only services one stack of the building, and their project documents say that that stack of the building is responsible for the repair and upkeep of that chiller system. So when you have these scenarios, you have to do a second reserve study specific for the items that is only you know, pertinent to a portion of the building, and that way that second reserve study will allow you to separate the costs for the owners who are responsible um, for that item. Um, how do you know when the components need to be replaced? Uh, a lot of times we look at the past history. If you paint your building every eight to 10 years, you know it has a useful life of eight to 10 years. Uh, manufacturer manuals and warranties often spell out um, a useful life for an asset. Uh, there's a lot of published data that you can find to determine um, you know, a useful life. Uh, what I like to do is um, I like to ask contractors. If I got a service contract, you know, say for a heat pump, and I got somebody coming in quarterly that's maintaining the equipment, I like to ask them, hey, we don't, how long do you think I have left on, on this heat pump? When do I need to replace it? Um, that's a very good indication of uh, useful life. You can ask um, third-party professionals, architects, engineers, reserve specialists um, to provide you this information. And you can also do comparisons with other buildings. If you got booster pumps in one building that's same size, same brand, and you know their useful life, you could use that um, for yours. A uh, third component uh, for an accurate reserve study, how much will it cost? How much will it cost to paint the building? How much will it cost to do the pipes? How much will it cost to replace the windows? Um, I like to get contractors' estimates. Um, sometimes if you're doing a reserve study and you ask a contractor, hey, give me a bid for this, and they know you're not actually you know, going to do the work, it's sometimes hard to get that. But if you have service providers who are looking at things regularly, um, that's a good time to ask them, how much will it cost? Um, and there's also published data, um, and you can uh, go out to uh, a same, again, uh, contractors, uh, architects, engineers, and ask them you know, for estimates uh, to, to replace certain assets. And, and I think that's the best way to uh, accurately predict how much you know, you'll need to put away is when you know, somebody tells you, well, you know, I, I will charge you this much money to you know, paint your building. Put that amount in your reserve study. Um, Hawaii law has uh, two methods uh, to uh, calculate uh, reserves. The first is a percent funded method and the second method is uh, the cash flow method. So the percent funded method um, says, uh, uh, fund a minimum of 50% of the estimated replacement reserves. So this is a simple um, calculation. If you have an asset that costs $100 uh, to replace and it has a 10-year life, if you put $10 away for 10 years, when it comes due, you will be, you'll have $100, you will be 100% funded. Well, the law requires you to be 50% funded. So if you put $5 away for 10 years, you will have $50. You won't have enough to replace that component. 50% is a statutory minimum. But if you're, um, if you're funding to replace an item, you need to make sure that you put enough money away such that you meet the statutory minimum, minimum and you have enough money to do the project when it comes due. Uh, the other method is the cash flow method. This is sometimes known as the pooling method. Um, it's a minimum 20-year projection to fully fund its replacement reserve requirements each year. Basically, cash flow looks at projects year to year. It pulls them together, and it looks at total costs. So it'll say 2017, you'll have 100,000 uh, projects. 2018, you'll have 200,000. 2019, you may not have anything. But it looks at year to year and how much money you'll need in the bank to fund those projects when they come due. Um, 
the, the difficult thing with cash flow is that it allows you to take your reserves down to $1. So when we're doing a, a cash flow plan, we like to set thresholds such that, you know, maybe you don't ever go below $250,000 or an amount that is comfortable, you know, for your association because things happen, things, you know, sometimes things cost more than you anticipated. So you definitely want those contingencies um, built in. Some helpful tips um, to performing a, a reserve study. Well, first, the, the law puts the burden on uh, board members to collect reserve funds. So if uh, a board member is, uh, or the board is not uh, comfortable performing the reserve study, you can outsource it to a reserve specialist or maybe even your management company um, to perform the reserve study. But the burden is still on the board to collect the reserve funds. Reserve studies should be updated annually. If you complete a project in 2017, your next reserve study should so show that project has been recycled and put back into a future year for the next time it comes due. Uh, you need to adjust annually for changes in interest rates and inflation. You need to add details and notes. This is extremely important because uh, things change, people change, you know, sometimes you change management, sometimes you change, you know, resident managers, sometimes board members change. And your reserve study is a 20 year prediction. And so a few years from now, somebody else comes in, you want to make sure that they have the notes that, you know, you use to come to the determinations that you came to. So in my reserve studies on my note section, I like to put, you know, if I have an asset that's, you know, serviced regularly, who services it? You know, how often they come? If they give me an estimate, you know, to replace that, I, you know, put that in there. Hey, this number we have in a reserve study came straight from a contractor. This is how much they'll do it. You know, uh, this is how much they'll charge to do the work. So it, um, you know, the, the notes is definitely um, important. Add contingency funds, don't just fund the minimum. Um, like I said earlier, things sometimes cost more than anticipated. Labor rates go up, uh, petroleum goes up. Um, so if you are funding the statutory minimum or you're putting the minimum away, you know, just to get by, you know, likely, you know, if things change, if, you know, uh, a project costs more than you anticipated, you may not have enough money to do it when it comes due. And one thing that I, um, that I often see is boards don't plan for professional services. So if you have a large project, you may need to hire a spec writer. You may need to hire an engineer or an architect. You know, these, the, these professionals cost a lot of money. And then sometimes you need uh, project oversight, project management. Um, management could cost 10% of the contract. So if in the reserve study you're only funding for the contracted price, how are you going to pay for these professionals? So you need to um, take that into consideration. Uh, put the time in. I, I don't necessarily think reserve studies are very difficult to do, but I do feel that they take time and effort. Um, if you uh, walk the property, if you carefully look at the projects coming up in the next three to five years, really evaluate, do I have enough money? Is it going to last me five years? Do I need to move it up three? You know, uh, put the time in, and that really will allow you to, you know, have an accurate reserve study. Preventative maintenance is very important. Um, if you want to maximize the useful life of a, of a component, you definitely want to do the regular uh, maintenance. Um, the best example I can give is asphalt paving. So your asphalt typically lasts maybe 20 to 25 years, but you should be seal coating your asphalt maybe every four to five years, and that could definitely maximize the life of your asphalt, uh, possibly even extend it. You know, maybe you can get 35 years out of it if you're constantly, you know, doing the preventative maintenance. Uh, benefits of a reserve study, uh, owners should pay their fair share. That is the purpose of a reserve study is that everyone contributes to it. If you're, you know, say I live in a, a high-rise condominium for the past, you know, 20 years that has an elevator, and then I sell my unit and the next person comes in and they get special assessed to replace the elevator, well, I just benefited from the last 20 years. I never had to pay a cent to, you know, replace it. So you really want to be collecting, you know, um, a fair amount every year such that you have the money, you know, to do it. And it's not the future owners who are burdened with having to replace certain assets. Reserve studies affect the ability for owners to obtain new or refinance loans. So um, I know a lot of lenders have minimum requirements that they look at prior to uh, uh, providing a homeowner a loan on, on the property. I know VA and FHA, I believe last time I checked, was 10%. They want to see 10% of your budget being contributed to reserves. So if you have $100,000 budgets, you have to have at least 10000 of that going into reserves. Otherwise, your homeowners may not get lending, you know, from certain institutions. 
Reserve studies can avoid special assessments, loans, large maintenance fee increases, which affect sales, property values, and delinquencies. Deferred maintenance costs more in the long run. Uh, reserve study serves and is, as an effective communication tool. They help prioritize business plans and uh, preventative maintenance needs. Uh, reserve study demonstrates uh, compliance with state statute. You know, like I said earlier, the law requires an association uh, uh, performs a reserve study. Uh, provides evidence that the board members are complying with their fiduciary duty and minimizes chance of litigation. Um, board members volunteers, um, if they don't perform a reserve study, you know, they're, they're putting themselves at uh, personal liability, which uh, John talked about a little earlier. Um, and a few things um, from the, from the uh, Hawaii statute that I want to point out. Um, the reserve, uh, so this comes straight from the law, uh, reserve funding method shall not be used to circumvent contributions required in the reserve study. So basically, you have to provide an accurate reserve study. If you know and your elevators are going to cost 300000 to replace, put 300000 in the reserve study. Don't you know, cut that down to 200000 because you, know, you want to save some money. Uh, too often, I see uh, boards trying to work backwards. They, they don't want a maintenance fee increase this year, so let's manipulate the reserve study such that we don't have to have a fee increase. Let's push all these projects down the line so we don't have these uh, funding requirements. Um, so that, that is a clear violation of the law. Uh, reserve funding plan cannot reflect future loans and assessments. Well, that's the purpose of res reserve studies, so you don't have to get an assessment or a loan. You know, loans and assessments are there for emergencies or things that you weren't, you know, uh, anticipating. So you can't put a loan or a special assessment, you know, five years out in your reserve study. Um, that's a violation of the law. Uh, and finally, no association or unit owner, director, officer, managing agent, or employee of an association who makes a good faith effort to calculate the estimated replacement reserves for an association shall be liable if the estimate subsequently proves incorrect. So it's not a crystal ball. It's difficult to, you know, predict the future. Um, so that's why I said if, if you, you know, uh, or that's why I said don't fund the minimum. You know, add for contingencies. You know, if put a little extra in there and that way you'll have a you know well-funded reserve and and hopefully you know if you plan for these contingencies you'll have enough money to do the projects when they come due and you won't have to go back to your ownership and say hey you know we didn't you know plan properly so I'm sorry you got you know a special assessment this year um, so in conclusion well-funded reserve may prevent special assessments improve property values and ensure everyone pays their fair share um, so that concludes my section um, Milton Motooka is up next, and Milton hasn't been properly introduced, so I'd like to um, uh, introduce him. Milton uh, is a partner in the firm Motooka and Rosenberg, has been practicing law in Hawaii for more than 35 years. His practice is devoted almost exclusively to the representation of community associations. He is a member of the charter class of the College of Community Association Lawyers. The college is comprised of attorneys who have distinguished themselves in the field of community association law and community service. Only, six, only 26 community association attorneys nationwide were selected for this induction into the charter class. Milton was the only attorney selected from Hawaii. He is the recipient of the Richard M. Gurley Distinguished Service Award in 1997 for his contributions to Hawaii Community Association industry in law. Milton Motooka. Thank you. Um, my section has to do with the do's and don'ts of rulemaking, so if you'll turn to that right now. Um, how many of you have been involved in um, a rules enforcement case? May I see your hands? Okay, how many of you have been involved as owners, as board members? Okay. Um, since the majority of you have not, um, what I would like to do with my section is go through the creation of rules so that you can avoid being in a dispute about rules going forward. Um, the board is, as we have heard, the governing body of the association. And so with the board, you have the executive, the legislative, and judicial branches all rolled into one. And with great power comes great responsibility. In essence, the board sets the culture for the project. What kind of place is it? 
Is it going to be the type of project that just is very stringent on the enforcement of the rules? Or is it going to be a pleasant place that is reasonable and tries to create an atmosphere mm -hmm. that is harmonious? It's a place, is this the kind of project that you would want to live in? And if the answer is yes, then you're doing a good job. Because in essence, that's what makes a project uh, you know, valuable and the prices will rise. Rules are sometimes called house rules, covenants, um, and you will find them in the project documents. And they vary in different communities. Rules and restrictions are designed to basically enhance property values, as I alluded to. It sets the quality of life within the community. It provides certainty and order so that you know what's expected of you, but more importantly, you know what you can expect when you buy into this project. And this is what makes a community association work. When people buy into a association and want to treat it like a single family home and can do whatever they want, um, that's usually a formula for disaster for the association and the owner. Um, the rules are also there to protect the freedom and safety of the residents. It sets the parameters, again, of how things are to be conducted. Uh, there's no association that deliberately sets forth uh, to make rules that are controversial or vague, but sometimes it happens, and board members have a responsibility to listen to the association members to find out if something is not working, then how can we improve it? But before discussing whether a rule is legal, it should be remembered that there are three sources for rules and restrictions. The restrictions that the developer has created is usually found in the declaration um, for condominiums. That's the place you would look. Restrictions added to the governing documents are usually the amendments to the declaration, and they're voted on by the members. And usually it's going to take a 67% vote to amend. And then there are restrict restrictions created by the board. Oftentimes these are the house rules. These apply to the overall day-to-day -day living. But as a board member or as an owner, you need to be aware, you cannot create a house rule that does not have support in either the declaration or bylaws. Uh, you can't create restrictions just in the house rules. And let me give you an example of that. For example, there was a board that decided that they wanted to make the rentals of the units for any less than 30 days illegal. And so an owner challenged this because the owner pointed out there is nothing in the bylaws um, or declaration that sets that prohibition up. And so he brought suit and he won and the court basically found that unless you have that type of restriction on renting in the bylaws, you can't put it in the house rules. And the logic for that is this. In order to amend the declaration, usually takes 67% or 75, depending on whether you have opted into 514B. If you want to amend the bylaws, it's 67%, and that's Again, a large percentage for the ownership to change um, different restrictions within the project. But let's look at what it would take to amend the house rules. If the house rules can be adopted by the board, let's say you have a nine member board and a quorum of the board is five. So at a meeting, let's say you have the bare quorum five and then the majority of that quorum decides that they want to change the house rules. So now you're down to three. That means if the board can just make house rule changes that affect how you can use your unit, that gives too much power to the board. So again, check your source. Make sure you have the authority to make changes. In general, um, courts recognize six criteria for de determining whether a rule is valid. First question, is it legal? A rule is legal if it does not unreasonably restrict a constitutional right. 
It's legal if it is consistent with the project documents and federal and state and local statutes. And finally, does not exceed the scope of the board's rulemaking authority. Does it have a legitimate purpose? A rule has a legitimate purpose if it relates to the operation and mission of the association. A rule must be appropriate for the association, such as noise rules, to ensure tranquility in the project. Is it reasonable? A rule is reasonable if it is fair and sensible. It should not be excessive or petty. Um, for example, one project adopted a rule that in order to use the guest parking, you have to get a pass 30 days in advance. Now, that's ridiculous. If you have guests coming, usually you don't know they're coming 30 days in advance. Otherwise, you could make a reason for not being there when they wanted to come. Um, it's, it's the morning, you're a little slow, but then anyway, we'll catch up. Um, is it fair? A rule is fair if it does not single out or discriminate against a separate class or group of people to be treated differently without reason. For example, um, a rule prohibiting tenants from using the recreation room is unfair and tenants are not to be treated as any type of subclass of humans. Is it enforceable? A rule is enforceable if it can be applied uniformly rather than selectively or arbitrarily. Uh, here's an example of what I would call a lawyer's delight. The rule read, no unattractive yard art will be placed in the front yards. That would prohibit some of the owners from being in the front yards. <laughs> Okay, we're getting better, that's good. <laughs> is it clear? A rule is clear if it is stated in a way that eliminates ambiguity and confusion to comply with. Be practical when adopting, for instance, a noise rule. If you say you may not exceed eight decibels from 10 to 10 in the evening to 10 or eight in the morning, well, that's a very precise rule, but is it practical? Who walks around with a decibel reader? You know, so it, it just is very difficult. Oftentimes, you have to apply common sense, um, which is, again, somewhat arbitrary. Um, early in my practice, I represented this condominium, and the board got a complaint um, from an owner who happened, unfortunately, to be an attorney, and he was complaining that there was this whirring sound that made it impossible for him to get a good night's sleep. And so they sent the resident manager up and he could not hear anything. He even put his head down on the carpet to listen. And then he finally determined that the whirring sound was from a fan that the owner had below. And so this is what he reported to the board. Based on that, the board went back to the attorney and said, we're really sorry, but there's no noise violation. It's, it's you know, basically it's a worrying fan and, and, you know, he has a right to have a fan in his bedroom. And so we are not going to take any action. Well, then they got a complaint from the owner that had the worrying fan caused that noise that at three in the morning, he, he would hear this thunderous noise. And then it would happen periodically thereafter, and so he couldn't really sleep either. As it turned out, the attorney was dropping a bowling ball <laughs> on the floor. Honest, I don't make these things up, but that's what keeps us in business. Okay. Yeah. The best practice is if you're going to adopt a rule and you're not sure whether it's legal and, and you know, uh, functions the way it should and is above challenge, the best thing you can do is submit it to the association council because if you're having doubts about it, then have it checked out by an expert. And if, as John says, you want to do it on the cheap, maybe you can think about it this way. Ask yourself, is this a rule that Donald Trump would support? <laughs> if the answer is yes, it's probably illegal and you should submit it to consul. So bad. 
I did that um, for an ABCs program that I did for CI last year, and then one of the um, evaluations that came in said, well, he was basically good, but he should not have gotten political. So anyway, but that's, you know, I'm sort of like Don Rickles who just passed away. We, we tend to offend everybody. Um, the procedures for developing rules. Um, identify or confirm um, the community's authority to make a rule. Check your power source. Make sure that you have the right to do it in your documents. And when necessary, consult with association council. When it comes to house rules and updating the house rules, the most economical way I think you can do it is the board can go through and, and look at whatever amendments they want to make. And then when they have done that, then send it to council for review because then you minimize the role of council in the review. And that's, again, the most economical way of doing it. Evaluate the need for the rule. Ask, why is this rule important? Avoid knee-jerk reactions. Don't make a rule just because somebody comes in and complains. Research, is there a need for the rule? Unfortunately, the legislature is probably the entity that creates more legislation from knee-jerk reactions. Don't be like the legislature. Review the requests, make sure that there's a need for it. The fewer rules, the better in any association because the more rules you have, the more, more opportunities you have for controversy. Consider the immediate impact um, and long-term implications of um, adopting the rule. Consider how the owners and residents will react to the rule. And communication is crucial. The owners need to know what is being changed, why it's being changed. And if you tell the owners, explain to the owners why you're doing this, you have a much better chance of having the owners comply with it. As an example of this, um, one of the associations I represent recently adopted a rule that prohibited the feeding of feral cats. And for the animal lovers, this was not well received. But the communication with the ownership was, we are banning this because the feral cats are creating a nuisance. Their defecation and urination on cars you know, ruins the surface of the cars, and that's why we are banning it. And so if you communicate, as John said, with the owners, you have a much better chance of uh, the owners complying with it. You need to, in the rulemaking, define the scope and write a draft for the rule. Keep it simple and make it understandable, easy to follow. You need to advise them of the enforcement procedures when violations occur. Um, you have to have the due process, the right of appeal, and you also have to tell them what happens if they violate the rule the due process is exhausted and they are found, found to be in violation, what the fine will be. Um, verify that the rule is valid and enforceable. Again, check the power source. If you don't have the power or authority to do it, then you will not be able to enforce the rule. Give the proper notice um, of the change in the rule to the owners. Generally speaking, we always usually advise, give at least 30 days before a rule becomes effective. If necessary, um, vote and approve the rule if this is required. Um, usually, most of the bylaws provide that the boards can adopt any rule change. All they have to do is notify the owners and allow them to come to the next board meeting and voice any concerns. Once the rule has been properly adopted, give notice uh, again that this is the effective date and you have to give notice to not only owners but the residents because the residents are in fact the ones who will be required to follow it. So it makes no sense to just send it to the owners who may not be there. So once you have done all of that, then you have a set of rules that should be good to go. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk about insurance and risk. And for my part of the 
And for my part of this session, I'm going to call you all the same thing. So whether you're a co-op, condo high-rise, condo low-rise, townhomes, homeowners association, whatever, you're all going to be condos. So don't take offense, you're just condos. So what we're going to talk about is risk control and insurance. And basically you all, most of you have at least four areas of concern. You have a concern for the property that you may or may not have. If you're a homeowners association, you may have no property other than maybe a sign that introduces to who you are. But for most of us, we have buildings, we have rec centers, we have property that we have to be concerned about. We also have a liability issue, and everyone has a liability issue. You all have common and limited common areas. And in these areas, stuff can happen and claims result. So everybody has liability issues. We all collect funds for our associations to run. We have an issue of sometimes of funds being missing or lost. We also have the issue of loss of income. Now, not all of us have anything we can rent out, but there are associations that do have rec centers or do have tennis courts or things that they actually rent out and make money on. So they have another exposure there because if something should happen to that, they were counting on that income or they have an antenna on top of their roof, they're counting on that income to help with their maintenance fees. So you have an exposure there, some of you do, and we need to worry about that when it comes to insurance. So who insures what? Or oh, before I go into that, risk control techniques. Let me talk about the different ways that you can protect your property. With property, the easiest way is to buy insurance because nobody wants to self-insure a $20 million building. So you yours normally would buy insurance. You have that exposure. You pass it off to the insurance. Your liability losses are the same way. You have no desire to be responsible for a $500,000 claim that you would have to assess all owners for if you don't have insurance. So we always pass off the liability issues to insurance. We have the risk control guy come out and inspect. We make sure we don't have holes in our grounds where someone could hurt and break a leg. We make sure we have the signs up at the pool. We have loss control from the insurance company to come out check our grounds, make sure we're doing what we should be doing, that there's no hidden risks, that we've got it to the best of our ability to be covered and protected. With misappropriation of funds, you do have property management firms, you have co-signing of checks, you have all kinds of ways to protect your funds, but 514 B and A require that the association carry a bond for up to $500 per unit, so the, up to a maximum of 200,000. So basically, that's not a lot of money because some of us have much more in our reserves, but it's a help. And of course, you can always buy more. And of course, your property management firms have, ex uh, ex exp have coverage on your funds as well. Loss of income, again, if you're renting something out or you're making income, sometimes the contract will state that regardless if it's like an antenna, regardless of whether it's operating or not or the hurricane blew it off, they still continue to pay you maintenance fees, rental fees or whatever the case may be. So you can sometimes do that by contract. Worst comes to worst, lay it off on insurance. That's what it's there for. So let's talk about insurance. Okay, insurance is a contract, okay? It is. It's a contract between you and the insurance company. For the price you're paying, we're offering you so many services, we're offering you so many exposures, we're gonna cover your perils, we're gonna cover your, this is what we're insuring you for. It's enforceable by law, so if something does go wrong and the insurance company doesn't do right or you don't pay your premium and you felt we should still insure you, we can always figure that out in court. The basic policy names the AOAO, the association as the named insured. Not the owners, not the board. The basic property and liability policy names the association. The association owns the building. The association owns the common areas, okay? We all make up the association as members, but we're naming the association as, an additional, as the named insured. The policy lists the coverages and it lists exclusions. Nobody's gonna read through, other than insurance agents and every now and then your lawyers, 150 pages of a property policy or a liability policy. But when you need to find out if there's coverage there or not, you're going to ask the appropriate person to help you with that. A summary of insurance, and there is one in your packet, and you kind of need to look at that when we're going to be talking about insurance for condos, because we're going to talk about what the condo has to insure and then what you as individual unit owners have to insure, because they're not the same. And if you only rely on the condo insurance, you're not going to have enough if something happens to your unit. So basically, the master policy covers the building as originally built. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of our buildings were built in the 70s. It came with 
how can I say it, not quite canic appliances, I mean um, cabinets, but it came with press board appliance uh, cabinets. It came with formica maybe as our countertops. It came with linoleum in our kitchen. And we got carpet. Sometimes it was that orange long shag. Sometimes it was just green, because that was a, quite a popular color to match our green appliances. So basically, think back to what your unit probably looked like back when it was first built. We ensure, per your bylaws, as originally built. And there are some condos that came with no cabinets, because everybody could get to choose their own, or no flooring. Everybody got to choose their own flooring. They paid for it on their own. So we don't even cover that. But the typical condo came with cabinets, tubs, toilet sinks, walls, floors, ceiling, electrical plumbing, the light fixtures. All of that is under the master policy as originally built, subject to the deductibles that the association has. So when there is a claim, and how many of you have had a water claim, been involved in one? Aren't they horrible? Anybody had a fire? Oh boy, there's a couple of fires. So you know claims happen. And water claims are horrendous, and we normally, our agency normally gets five to seven a day, five days a week. That's a lot of water claims, because a lot of pipes and appliances are leaking, and it's always the top floor, okay? <laughs> the biggest water claim to date is a building where the top floor leaked down, all the way down, and it's anticipated that the extraction bill alone is $1.3 million. Extract, never mind the repair now of all these units, just the extraction bills in the neighborhood of 1.3 million. I was talking to the extraction people the other day. I thought, that's, that's the biggest I've ever heard. All right, so the master policy has certain perils we insure. We insure fire, lightning, windstorm, vehicle damage, a car loses control and plows through the lobby. That's under the master policy. Hopefully the car insurance will pay us back, but sometimes they don't have enough insurance. Hail, now we used to never have a problem with hail in Hawaii, though we did a couple of years ago, and it's amazing the number of townhomes that had hail damage. Collapse, water overflow, sudden and accidental from a domestic plumbing system. That is the worst one. Those are all the leaks we're having, whether they're common element pipes that are leaking, whether they're your appliances that are leaking, whether you're leaving the tub on because you were yakking on the phone and forgot you were filling it up. We have a lot of water claims, and that is the worst type because they're preventable. 99% of them are preventable. If we would maintain our appliances, if we would not leave the water running, if we would read the notice in the elevator that said the water is going to be turned off from 8 to 4 that day, and at 9 o'clock we turned our water on and it didn't, oh, I forgot it, and we forgot to turn it off, and we just left it on and went to work. I can't tell you how often that happens when there's a water turn off in a building. Somebody turns their handle on, forgets about it because there's no water came out, then, oh yeah, that's, and this goes and forgets to turn it off. So they're preventable, most of them. Master policy covers the common and limited common areas, okay, and the unit as originally built. So let's say you're the poor soul that has this water claim, and let's say it came from your unit, and you got to call at the office, and you have to go home because there's two inches of water in your unit and down three floors, okay? The master policy is going to hire the extractor, going to pay the extractor to come in and extract and dry out all the walls and everything that's part of the as originally built. And let's say there's cabinet damage. But let's say your unit had a beautiful upgraded wood floor instead of the shag that it came with in 1970. We're going to give you money for carpet, not for that wood floor. We cover as originally built per your bylaws. There is no way we can give you what your improvements are. Think about it, we have no way of knowing what any unit owner is doing inside, and we would have to inspect constantly every unit if we had to ensure what was the improvement. So that's your responsibility as owners. The problem is, when many of you, if you bought your unit back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, the mortgage company could have given a hoot about whether you had an HO6. An HO6 is a homeowner's form six. It's designed for condo unit owners. In the old days, the mortgage companies didn't care. All they cared about was the master policy. They knew if there was a claim, they'd get back their investment because it's going to be insured. They didn't care about your contents. They didn't care about your improvements. They didn't care about your loss of use. What has happened in the last five to seven years is the mortgage companies are now realizing it is important to make sure owners have the complementary policy to the master called the HO6. 
So mortgage companies today do say, and where's proof of your insurance? So sometimes when you go to close a loan, or if you're trying to sell or refinance, you have to show proof of your HO6. So if you don't have one, you should buy one, and you should make sure everybody in your complex has one. Because when there is a claim, relying on just the master policy, you're gonna be short. Remember, we cover as originally built. So you have to move out of your unit for five days while it dries, because it's a sauna in there when they're drying it. Who's gonna pay for that? Not the master policy. Who's gonna pay the fact that your electric bill, if you're individually electric, have electricity, went up four times? Not the master policy, your HO6 is. Who's gonna care, care about the damage to your contents? Not the master policy, it's your HO6. I'm the unit below. Well, it's the guy up above, it's his fault. No, it's not his fault. You have to insure your own stuff. If you don't insure your risk, you're out. It's all coming out of your pocket. You can try to say, oh, unit owner up above, your, your appliance broke, your washing machine hose broke, your ice maker leaked, and it leaked for 10 hours, and it ruined my unit below you. The courts are going to say, unit owner didn't do it on purpose. It was an accident. Unit owner below, why don't you have insurance to protect your asset? Your biggest asset for most of us is what we live in or what we own. It is the property. So by not spending money on an HO6, which many owners have no concept that they need this policy, even though I yak about it all the time, and it's relatively inexpensive, a couple hundred dollars a year, sometimes even less. It is so important that everybody has both policies so that you can get back to square one. At the end of the day, after the claim is all done, and it takes weeks, don't expect it back in in two to three weeks or have it all accomplished. It takes weeks by the time you call the contractor in to fix up the holes he made, to repaint, get the new flooring that you've got to order from Home Depot or whatever the case may be. It is a long process. And during that time, you could be out two to three weeks of your unit. And who wants to pay the mortgage, pay the maintenance fees, and now have to go rent something? Wouldn't it be nice to call your HO6 carrier and say, hey, all state, state farm, or whoever you're insured with, I can't be in my unit for two weeks, where do you want me to go? And know that they're gonna cover that for you. So it's an important little policy that all owners need to have. So if you take a look at the summary of insurance which is in your packet. This is a typical Waikiki condo. It's a huge condo. It's done back in 2008, but it still applies today. You will see that they're insured for 140 back then. They're insured for 150 million roughly. You will see that they carry a $5,000 deductible. So this water claim that caused on the 20th floor, it went down three floors, has a $5,000 deductible. Today, that $5,000 deductible will be charged back to the 20th floor unit owner because this condo's in 514B and did opt into the insurance section. So besides having to lose the use of your unit, have your unit a mess, holes in the wall, you now have to also pay the deductible. But if you have that HO6, you're gonna turn the assessment letter over to your HO6 carrier, who's gonna pay for it, along with putting you up elsewhere, along with your electric bill, along with the damage to your contents and, and your improvements. So for $200, it's a great little buy. So the deductible can be charged back to the unit owner or to the unit that caused the claim. So if you have a tenant who causes a claim, sets the unit on fire while cooking, you as the unit owner will be charged back the deductible, okay? Even if it's a common element pipe that backs up or breaks, you could be charged that deductible. There's three things the association, the board can do with the deductible. They can pay for it out of everybody's maintenance fees. They can charge it to the unit that caused the claim, the washing machine hose, the ice maker, the person who set the place on fire, or they can divide it amongst the unit owners involved in the claim. So if we have a $5,000 deductible and we have five units because it's early and I don't want it to divide too badly, we can say, gee, we don't know why that common element pipe backed up. Plumber found nothing in there or he found a diaper, but there's three kids, three babies above, so we don't know which owner it is. So we're gonna divide that $5,000 amongst your five owners. You're all gonna suffer $1,000 of the association's deductible. You're all gonna get a letter that says, we're assessing you $1,000 of this claim. That assessment letter can be turned over to your HO6 carrier who will then help you with that. If you don't have the HO6, it's your loss, even though it was a common element pipe. 
because that common element pipe is owned by all of us who own the condo. And we don't know why it backed up, or we know why it backed up because there was a diaper there, but we don't know which kid threw his diaper down the toilet and created the claim. So it gets assessed to all who received proceeds from the claim. So keep that in mind. This HL6 policy, which I stress and stress and stress, is very important for owners. The board will get the right amount of coverage that they need. They're going to deal with a professional who's going to say, this is what you're building and appraised for, replacement cost. This is what your bylaws say you have to insure. OK, they're going to get taken care of. But we have to worry about you as owners, because you need to make sure you're buying an HO6. Just like the summary here for this Waikiki condo, the HO6 comes with property coverage, your property, your contents, your upgrades. It comes with liability. So if you're out golfing, you have somebody with a golf ball, or you're walking your dog on property, and he bites somebody, that's your HO6. You don't have that policy. That's your loss when you get sued. That's out of your pocket. Okay? The association, all associations buy an umbrella policy. And an umbrella policy, some of us as individual unit owners oh, have an umbrella policy. It covers above our cars and our property, just in case something goes wrong. Okay? So the same thing for the association. They buy an umbrella policy, and if you think of the handle of an umbrella, that's your general liability, that's your directors and officers, that's your workers' comp if you have employees. Once these limits are used up in a claim, the umbrella part, the part that protects you from the rain, pays an additional millions. For this association, it's $25 million. It's a large condo. So they're protecting everyone's assets by buying this umbrella. Okay? You as owners sometimes may need an umbrella. Maybe you just can't rely on the 300000 that's in, on your homeowner's policy because your unit's worth more. And as we get older, our units seem to get worth more and more because of the inflation. And when you think what you paid for it and what you could sell it for, is 300000 enough? That's a determination you have to decide. OK, so just like um, every condo, and some of you may run for the board someday, or some of you are on it, every condo c covers directors and officers liability. Okay? This DNO coverage protects them in case something goes wrong. They're serving for free. We make mistakes. Sometimes we don't make mistakes, but we still get sued because somebody thinks we made a mistake. Okay? But this protects not only the board, it protects the association. Because if they don't buy directors and officers coverage, that means, and there's a claim, it's coming out of your maintenance fees. So you always want to make sure your directors and officers have insurance because they're humans and they do make mistakes. If you're in a flood zone, you're going to have to carry flood insurance. If the association, if you live in an association that is in a flood zone, you don't have to carry flood insurance unless you want to cover it for your contents. So when you get that letter from your mortgage company, you just have to turn it over to the association and they'll show that the condo has purchased flood insurance, but you have the option of buying it for your contents if you want. But the association buys it for the building. Okay? Association, we talked about the bond before, how they all have it, and how they need it to protect your association. So this is a typical insurance summary. No matter who your insurance agent is, you usually get this once a year when your um, annual meeting packet goes out. And you should look at this and say, gee, what is the association's deductible? Because that you have to insure. So if you look under property, you will see on this one, their deductible was $5,000. Sometimes you'll see $10,000. There's a condo with twenty five, dollars and I got one with $50,000. That means the first $50,000 of any claim is on the back of you as the unit owner. So it's very important that you look at this to determine what is the association's deductible. And do I now call my insurance agent and say, whoops, the association's deductible from last year went from $5,000 to $25,000. Hey, insurance agent, give me more insurance. Because if I cause the claim, I don't want my insurance to say, gee, Sue, you got a letter for $25,000, but you only got $5,000 worth of coverage. Guess you cough up the other $20,000 by yourself. We don't want that to happen to you. So you always should check once a year when you get this what the deductible has changed to. And then you have to call your agent. When you make improvements in your unit, you gutted it. You spent $50,000. Who's going to insure that beautiful new kitchen or bathroom that you just did? Not the master policy. We cover as originally built. Every owner needs to take responsibility for what you do in your unit. OK? So the HO6 covers your personal property, your improvements to the structure, your loss of use or your loss of rental income. If you're a landlord 
and you rent out your unit, you can still buy an HO6. Instead of loss of use, you're going to lose rental income. The insurance company will pay you that rental income because you had a water loss and you have to move your tenant out. Or you had a fire and it's not going to be ready for six months and you don't want to lose that $3,000 a month. You can insure it. Okay? Covers the association's deductible and believe me, as deductibles are going up, that is even more important sometimes than our stuff that it covers. Because we all say we got more junk than we need. We could live with a lot less, but nobody wants to be assessed a $25,000 deductible or a $50,000 deductible. That's a chunk of change that you do owe the association. And of course, the HO6 covers your personal liability. So in conclusion, board members do owe a duty of ordinary care to their owners. They need to make sure they get the right insurance. They need to make sure they follow what their bylaws say about what they have to cover. Okay? They have an obligation to act as reasonable, prudent people in reducing the association's exposure to risk of loss. They can't say, oh, we don't need an umbrella. We don't want to spend that extra $2,000. We've got to save money this year because we have to do this pipe. And, oh, God, our owners are already upset. No. You've got 50 owners. You have 50 people's assets there. If something goes wrong, and there is a settlement of 3.8 or 2.1 or 1.9 against an association, and you only have a million dollars worth of coverage, who's paying the rest of that? All your owners. And many of your owners carry an umbrella policy, a personal one, so the condo needs to carry one as well. So the, the association's job, the board's job, is to make sure they reduce the risk to you as owners for the things that the association owns. Board members can reduce the association's exposure to risk by controlling the likelihood and extent of losses and by purchasing insurance. We have a lot of loss control wrecks that go unanswered. We have right now a condo that I recently picked up. Insurance company, no one said anything to me. Insurance company goes out and sends loss control and says, Sue, do you know that the attorney sent a letter out to every owner and said, don't go on your lanai because the railings are falling? We just picked this account up. Insurance company said, we want off. Now, no insurance company wants to insure anybody whose railings are falling off and the chance of somebody going out. I said, hold on, give me 30 days. Property management firm worked with me. We got a, a construction crew out there. And just like at Ala Moana Shopping Center, if you've been there recently, there's nothing but wood covering every railing. So is this condo. They've got wood on every railing blocking it two feet in front of the railing so you can't possibly even get to the railing because there's this ugly piece of wood on everybody's lanai so when the railing falls off you're not again leaning against it now they are going to have it corrected they are working on that but that takes time building permits you know getting bids it's going to eventually they'll get back to very nice railings but you have to take care of your property and when it's a life safety issue like what happened at Al Moana Shopping Center and the railings, or those of you who say, well, we're not going to deal with spalling, and then the spalling falls and hits somebody. Or we have windows where a child, they're low windows because it's an old, old project, and there's no air conditioning, so they leave the window, they leave it open, and a child decided to, got, mother was on another floor, child somehow got in the elevator, kids, and went down a floor or two, and he climbed up on a table near the railing and fell out. Okay. Now we have railings, we have windows that need to be repaired. These are life safety issues that the insurance companies go ballistic on when you don't maintain or when you decide we're not going to do this. So please always, and I've been at a board just recently where they said, but that's what we have insurance for, Sue. Why do we care if the spalling falls off or the railings fall off? That's what insurance is about. Well, it may be to cover the first time, but then after that, your insurance costs are going to be horrendous. So don't get upset when your reserves or your maintenance fees have to go in increased because we need to make sure that you are adequately covered. We need to make sure that you can buy insurance because none of us want this exposure on our back. We would all sell our condos tomorrow if we couldn't insure them because nobody wants that exposure. I stress to you, do not kick the can down the road when it comes to maintenance issues. We are now having more and more claims against boards who are doing that. So you as unit owners should be demanding that your maintenance fees be increased so you have the money to cover your railings and to cover your spalling. 
And I know for you who are board of members, it's not pleasant to, involve, to say you're going to increase your maintenance fees. But I did it at my condo with a 40% increase one year. Because when we looked at everything, just the numbers, and we divided it out, we said, we don't have enough money. And the board had to admit we did not. And where did we hear screaming and yelling? But three years later, when the chiller broke, and we had to pay $350,000 to fix it, and we had the money because we had increased our fees, everybody said, okay, we forgive you. Of course, they made me the board president, and I've been the board president since. So that's my spiel for you. Thank you. Okay, if you have questions, hold the sheet up and um, Mel, are you here? Can you help us gather up the questions? While we're gathering them up, go to your evaluation form and work on that for now while we sort through the questions. Okay, I've got one that says, uh, what are limited common elements? A limited common element is uh, a, a common element that is a pertinent to a specific unit. So sometimes, say, a lanai may be a limited common element. Only one owner gets to use that common element, you know, and so that's why it's limited. Um, I have an association where uh, driveways are limited common elements. Um, that's, that's a limited common element. And the second question I, I can't read. If, if I can add to that too, limited common elements are, if you look at your declarations, it will define what your common elements are and what your limited common elements are. So you need to look at your declaration. And while I've got the mic, uh, inspection of units, I did talk about the um, inspection and for the, I, I, what was it, the um, high risk components, we usually hire a plumbing company. And, and usually we have a maintenance person, a company, that employee. It's usually, a, you know, a plumbing company or a plumbing contractor or a plumbing consultant or a contractor. And they will do, be, mainly because the components that they're looking at are plumbing, you know, like the washer hoses, the, P, the, P, the, the valves, the toilets, 
so it's, it, it, you know, so it's a, it's a plumber. Um, and you can, you can uh, you know, do a contractor, but it's not a board member, at least not in, in my experience. The people that I know uh, who have uh, done these inspections, it's usually you contract with a company and, uh, and you have an association employee accompany that person uh, to, to the various units. And, you know, there's usually a schedule uh, so everybody knows when that person is coming. Uh, and uh, so it's not a board member. And the second question is executive meetings. Um, and it's like um, the board has had monthly executive meetings for undisclosed legal matters. Do owners have a right uh, to know about what happens? And, and the answer is no, mainly because legal matters are uh, issues uh, that are pending. Uh, these and sometimes they are very, you know, sensitive issues uh, that need to be confidential. Sometimes the attorney is there, and so there's an issue of an attorney-client privilege. So usually those issues are not uh, made public, mainly because uh, you know you, you don't want to be discussing confidential issues with members of the association who maybe might know some of the parties or you know might be you know otherwise involved so it's it's it's, it's so those matters are confidential are not public and um, there are minutes of executive sessions they are separate they are not included with the minutes of the regular meeting and uh, those minutes of the executive session are not made public uh, to the unit owners because they relate to confidential uh, uh, matters. And it, usually what happens in executive session are legal matters, personnel matters. In other words, if, if an employee is being disciplined or maybe you're talking about firing somebody, you don't want to make those discussions public. Uh, um, and so they are confidential. Um, and I, and there's there's another question, but I, I I will get back to that. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to three, knock out three. Who is responsible for the loss if an owner causes loss to others? Does the causing owners HO6 pay for all affected owners? No. Everybody's own HO6 has to take care of your upgrades, your contents, your loss of use. Not the HO6 of the owner who causes the claim. Only if I am negligent, and that's very hard to prove, I have to be legally liable, negligent for what I did, for my homeowners to cover your damage. So everybody who lives below me has to have an HO6. And that HO6 will take care of your hotel expense, it'll take care of your contents, not mine who caused the claim. Okay, because accidents happen in condo land, just like they happen in your house if you had a single family home. So you have to have your own policy to take care of you. If you don't have a policy, it's out of pocket time. Okay, so the HO6 is a great little policy that everybody should have. Question here says, who's gonna cover my property that has to be store stored while they're redoing my unit? Your HO6 is. If you don't have an HO6, you're paying for it. Okay, not the unit owner who caused the claim. It's your money, it's your stuff, you insure it. Okay, this HO6 is an important little policy. It is recommended that the board make a written resolution on how the deductible is to be assessed. It's hard to make a written resolution. 514B wrote it down. You got three options. You pay for it out of association funds, you charge it to the unit owner who caused the claim, or you divide it. So you have to look at each claim because you have to say, well, what happened here? Well, Sue's washing machine leaked. Well, then Sue's paying the deductible. Or you say, gee, it came from the common element. The plumber found a diaper in there. We don't know which kids did it, or we found a toy in the pipe, or we found a Coke bottle. These are all things we find. So we're gonna, in that instance, the board makes the decision to say, well, we're gonna divide it amongst, the deductible amongst all the owners. If you have your HO6, you should not care. Your insurance company is there for you. Three questions found, next. Okay. Um, 
on your HO6, but if you're paying the deductible on your HO6, it's usually $500 is the standard deductible. You've probably had to use loss of use, you probably had to be moved out, you probably had some damage to your upgrades, and you have the loss assessment. So it's $500 is the most you should be out as your own personal deductible. If you can't afford a $500 deductible, buy the policy with $250. It goes as low as $250, okay? That's your decision, but it's just like when you park your car at Alamo Moana Shopping Center and somebody hits it and leaves, it's your deductible, okay? So you have to be realistic of what you can afford in case you do have to use your insurance. Thank you. So I, I have a few questions here on board um, members. One of them concerns, I, I think it's really, what can an individual director do when it's discovered that a board president is behaving unethically and violating their duty. Ideally, you would like that to think that all the other directors except the president would recognize this because, of course, the president only serves uh, at the will of the rest of the board. So ideally, the individual director would talk to the other board members and they would remove the person as president if the president's behaving unethically. If for some reason the other board members are not willing to act, you have a more difficult problem because then you might have to either consider some type of mediation, arbitration, as Jane was explaining, or taking the matter to the owners. And it's never completely clear. You would hope the owners would have the same concerns as you, but ideally, if you're a director thinking or finding that the president's behaving unethically, the best thing would be if the other board members acted to remove him. Uh, let's see, there's a, what, is this? what can a director do if the board president, um, oh, I think that might be a repeat, let's see. Can a director sue another board member? Yes, this is America, anyone can sue anyone. <laughs> but the, you know, what you would probably be trying to look at is if the director, the other director or the president is just completely unwilling to um, recognize what they should be doing, that may be the problem. You could probably consider a mediation, as Jane pointed out, the Real Estate Commission sponsors that and subsidizes it. So those might be things, but it, you could sue another director, you could sue the president, you might want to look at other options before you did that. Can the board president dictate most discussions? They are the presiding officer, but ultimately um, the directors also have a right to participate in the meeting, so I don't think that the director can dictate, I'm sorry, the president cannot dictate decisions. Those are supposed to be made by the members of the board, and if they don't, then they have, they have their own problems too. But the reality is, and I'm assuming that's what's happening here, is Sometimes if you have a very strong president, they tell board members what they're going to decide. And I'm not sure what to tell you about that type of problem because you really have to, as a board, decide. If you are the minority director who doesn't feel this is correct and the rest of the people just sit there like bumps on a log and let the president tell them what to do, you do have some problems and that's when you might have to consider trying to force a mediation, consider arbitration, something like that. If I can just add to that, uh, the uh, statute does, as part of your fiduciary duty as a director, you have to exercise your independent judgment. And if you're sued as a board, and Sue will probably, you know, be able to, uh, you know, expand on this, and if, you know, under your offices and directors, the issue may come up, if the board president acted as a dictator and you never stood up and said anything and didn't put it on the record that you disagreed, then your officers, then your DNO may not protect you in a lawsuit if, if, it, if it is discovered that you never took any action to stop that person. And, and there was a lawsuit many years ago where a, a vice president was held liable for breach of fiduciary duty because he didn't stop the president. And in that case, I knew the president. There was no way in hell anybody would have been able to stop her. But he got, he was determined liable, and the judge entered a decision 
against him. And so, you know, so, you, so if you're on a board with a dictator, I mean, you, you need to, you know, at least place on the record, or if, there, if you can't, you know, put it on the record, at least have emails or, or something to say that you opposed what he was doing or she was doing and, uh, you know, objected to that. There's another question here about if, to what extent are current board members held responsible for past board's actions? For example, not budgeting the reserves for lap, cap, large capital re replacements. If, if the past board members who are owners challenge or the current board for the fact that there's not enough financial money needed because, I mean, if a board member, an owner came up to me and said that, hey, there's not enough money, we're holding you responsible, current board, all I would do is say, gee, I've been on the board now for a year, I looked at the financials when you were on the board, dears, and here's what you've had, here's how much more we've put aside, and don't worry, I'll be up in your maintenance fees very shortly so we'll have more in reserves. Give it back to them, because don't let people sit there and tell you as you sit on the board that you're wrong for something that you just inherited. You do have to take care of what you inherited and turn it around as a board member. And if you know you're under-reserved and you're under-insured or whatever the case may be, deal with it so that these kinds of things can't happen to you. I have a question, well, a series of questions, but I'm just going to um, address a couple of them. What is the legitimate purpose for a house rule limiting the weight of dogs? Um, that's a real touchy one, but generally speaking, uh, associations want to limit the size of the dog because, especially if it's a high rise and you have elevators, um, there's not much room for too many people if you have a Great Dane sitting in there with you. Um, secondly, there are a lot of people who are deathly afraid of dogs, and then so um, the limitation on the size of dogs is, I think, just to make it a more manageable situation. Um, I am always uh, concerned when a board uses a weight limit because when a dog comes in, and if it's a puppy in particular, um, they tend to grow. And then when they grow and they gain weight, and like humans, if they get fat, um, you know, you can't ask them to cut a leg to get them under the weight limit. So that's often tough. And what are you going to do? Are you going to have weight, you know, weigh-ins on the dogs? So those are problematic. Um, how would you structure a house rule to manage noxious odors in an apartment from another apartment? And this also is a real tough one because um, I've had this issue raised um, that my neighbor cooks Korean food and it's just really bad. My neighbor always has fish and that's really bad. And those are issues that I don't think lend themselves to a very easy um, response. And, you know, you may ask them if they can put some door stop underneath to keep the odors from drifting out. But aside from that, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, unfortunately, you give up certain rights when you move into a community association like a condominium. And, you can't legislate everything. And what may be a noxious order to you, to the person cooking it, obviously it's not a problem. Um, I have a question here about aging in place. Who can an association manager contact to conduct an evaluation? Catholic Charities was the organization, and, uh, and I've been in contact with them over the years. They still do that. They will, uh, uh, what happens is you contact them they will come in and do an assessment. And, and the statute makes it really clear. If you call Catholic Charities, their client is the resident who is living in the unit, even though the association will be paying the fee. And in the, uh, under the association uh, you know, uh, rules, I mean, you can assess that owner for the cost of that. And if it's a mental, if it's a mental disability, it's helping hands because they have psychiatrists on staff and they also are caseworkers. And what they do is they, and, 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 and I've seen it both ways. If the, so if the unit owner refuses to deal with that caseworker, there's not a whole lot uh, you can do. And you know, that's the quandary. I mean, what do you do if they don't cooperate? 
And um, that is the topic of probably a resolution I'm working with a legislator with, you know, and, and, and it, it, we have a situation where you have people living in condominiums who have mental or, you know, uh, uh, issues where they, they don't take care of their, their homes. And no matter what you do, they are into denial. They will tell you, leave me alone. This is my home. You can't tell me what to do. And, but you know, they have cockroaches that go into other units. There are smells that emanate that, you know, people complain about. And there's really not a whole lot of associations can do. And I am working with a legislator and probably next year we'll be setting up a task force because we've had issues where you call the uh, Office of Aging or Adult Protective Services and they will tell you, oh, there's nothing we can do. If they choose to live like that, then then there's nothing we can do. And that's even for a family member because a, a lot of associations, when they have a situation like that, we, they will, the association management will call the family member. That's why you, know, you all have the cards that say, who do we contact in case of an emergency? You contact the family member and even with the family member, adult protective services will say, there's nothing we can do. And so we recognize that there is an issue regarding that and we will be setting, working with the legislature to try to set up a task force uh, with different state agencies to uh, assist associations and family members on how to deal with those, you know, people who uh, just resist, um, you know, uh, help. But for Catholic Charities, I know, will help you with your uh, aging people. And I have one other question to feral cats. What if a tenant is feeding cats on public property, like on the sidewalks, what can you do? There's really nothing the association can do, but you can, I know that there was an issue somebody was talking about, about, you know, the, 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 the damage that feral cats can do. Uh, they cause maintenance issues. Your maintenance fees can go up, and you know, you need to start educating your residents that, you know, th this type of, uh, that they can't, um, uh, they should not be feeding the animals, the feral animals, because it causes problems. It will result in health and safety concerns, and it will raise their maintenance fees. And so it's, a, it's an education problem. It's not anything that the association can affirmatively stop. Okay, I got a couple of them. Um, this one might be a little tricky one. Uh, can the board decide to roll over excess funds at fiscal year end into a special operating reserve. Um, and then there's a second part of it relating to the uh, rollover resolution that happens every annual meeting. They said that they thought the, the rollover resolution says that only, you know, those funds will be spent first, so how can you put it into a special operating reserve? So um, if you're fortunate enough to have a surplus of funds at the end of the year and you have a lot of money in your operating account, it does make sense to create a special reserve. Uh, your checking accounts probably don't make a lot of interest, so put it into a savings account and create that special reserve. But if you adopt the rollover resolution that says you're supposed to spend that money first, well, don't put that money into the, the special reserves. Use your you know, old funds that you've had in the checking account. Put that into a special reserve, so that way you comply with the, the rollover resolution. And then a second one I have. Uh, for the annual reserve study, what's a good reference for interest rate and inflation rate? The reserve study is usually a 20-year prediction, so I like to use inflation, the average of the past 20 years, and that's, that's a pretty good indication of inflation rate. And then interest rate, um, the law uh, provides for how to calculate the interest rate, um, and I know it's an average, and I know it can't go below or above. Um, off the top of my head, it's in 514B, um, and i got to look that one up, but off the top of my head, I can't tell you what that one is. I have a fairly common question. The, the board president and property manager refused to answer my email questions. What do you suggest I do? I'm not, uh, I'm not actually sure they necessarily have to. The interaction between owners and the board and the property manager is supposed to be really at the meetings. And so, as Jane pointed out, sometimes that is not very um, well done. But 
the board president is a volunteer. They're not necessarily on duty 24-7. The property manager, if you're asking for documents or something like that, something they're required to provide by law. But if you just have questions you'd like answered, I don't know that there's any particular obligation to answer questions unless they are something covered by the law. And then there's a question about the president's newsletter column had um, unfounded statements and zero facts, which the person who gave this, I guess we're pretty familiar with that now. What are my options? Um, well, you could try to get the president to correct it, but it sounds like he wouldn't. The question would be if there's something about you, for example, that you've done something terrible, you could consider sending out your response. You could go to a board meeting and raise it. Try and put the president on the spot. Otherwise, again, Jane was suggesting it's, it's a bit of a fallback, but you've got mediation, arbitration. You could try and have it corrected that way. And then the only other ones, there were questions about my statement that employment at will is no longer necessarily the law. The theory of employment at will is you could terminate an employee at any time for no reason whatsoever. I think if you talk to people who specialize in employment law, generally you want to have a nice clear record nowadays of why you're doing it and that it was justified because it seems as if decisions being made by the courts are such that you can't just tell someone you're done, go away. You should have some record that there's a justification for it. So the employment at will, the idea you could just tell an employee, sorry you're done, leave tomorrow. It seems as if the courts are saying not necessarily because there may be improper motives for termination which we will look at and that's why I think if you talk to an employment law attorney they will tell you that you should try to be very careful about dealing with employees and I think that's something to remember and there were questions about what what is the board's role in dealing with a, a resident manager and essentially you are the representative of the employer the association's the employer you're the representative you are supposed to supervise, make sure they do their job, make sure they don't create problems for other residents. That would be your responsibility. But if you have a problem employee, I would suggest you consider, again, don't cheap it out, consider speaking to an attorney who specializes in employment law because it is sometimes difficult to know the parameters as the employer, as the representative employer of what you can and can't do. And it's probably worth your while spending an hour or two talking to an employment lawyer because difficult employees are often very willing to press their rights and bring claims with either labor department or someone else. So that would be my suggestion. It is your responsibility as a board, but be very careful how you exercise that responsibility. I have a question uh, and uh, uh, asking where in the statute is the aging in place? And I don't have it right on top of my head. If somebody, if the person who asked this question could see me after uh, the uh, after this and give me some contact information, I will get back to you with that. And and I, just as an aside, I was talking to Council Member Ann Kobayashi, who is now head of Parks and Recreation. She tells me that the Office of Aging for the uh, Oahu County is under her jurisdiction. And so she's looking into um, uh, a program and trying to get the Office of Aging to try to get different contractors, you know, who do like, you know, cleaning or uh, taking people to their doctor's appointments, all these services for disabled and uh, aging people. And, and so that it would be, you can call one place, the Office of Aging o Oahu County and get that information. And I, I, I commend her for doing that. She, she told me that she would be in, you know, implementing that uh, since she, that comes under her jurisdiction. And that would be a resource for uh, property management people 
And uh, we have had seminars on aging in place, and if, and if anybody's interested, they should be talking to their boards about getting their cooperation. If you can get a vendor to come to your building to do you know, cleaning for people who can't you know, do it, and you know, have parking available for them, and you, know, you have a building who have people who are away at work all day, ask them if they can use the parking stall for these you know, vendors. Uh, you know, to come to the building and, and provide services, and if and if you can get you know one you know if you can uh, you know get vendors to come and uh, provide these services for a bunch of people, maybe they will lower their costs. And so that's something that you know owners and boards can work together and uh, provide their uh, residents with you know these alternatives. And so that's something that you know uh, I've been encouraging over the years when we do these seminars on aging in place and and there is a provision in the statute and whoever you know sent this question if you will see me afterwards i will get back to you with that information okay we're just about out of time so what i'm going to do is i'm going to do the so-called like on the quiz shows the lightning round and we'll go on one question on for each of us going down um the question i'm going to deal with is unruly children i'm afraid of being tripped in the lobby, pool deck, et cetera, uh, by these unruly children. Everything has been done by management, but to no avail, what next? Wait until I'm knocked out. Um, actually, if it's a situation of unruly children in the common elements, and you know who they belong to, in other words, who the parents are, um, you can cite the owner of the unit where the child resides, and that's the most effective way because, as John said, you have to build a record. You cite them, you can find them, and when you find them, you usually get the owner's um, you know, undivided attention. And if the parents actually are the unit owners, then you find them. And if, you know, after you reach the max out, then it's sent to association council and you basically get a restraining order from the court or an order from the court that they have to supervise the children. They can't run amok. So you don't let them essentially commandeer the common elements um, to the adverse impact on all of the other residents. Okay, there was a question about what documents can be withheld from owners. If you look in Jane's materials, there's a long list of things you have to provide and then a paragraph that says, if you don't, you have to provide these, other documents can be withheld, but basically you have to have a good reason for doing so. So that's, I think, and it is in Jane's materials, it does explain that you must provide a long list of things, but not, um, you can withhold things not specifically listed. And that's 514B154, that's the omnibus, whatever documents you want, statute. And I've, I've done all my questions. Okay. I got one here that's uh, more property management than reserves, but uh, what communication methods besides mail uh, you think works efficiently for the association? Um, a lot of associations uh, keep track of emails. They have email trees. Uh, one of my associations, we just had our annual meeting, and we were going into the annual meeting with less than quorum. So we have phone numbers for all our um, members, so we made phone calls. Um, there's also new technologies um, out there for uh, phone applications, uh, one of them called uh, the condo app, where a uh, resident manager can send notifications, you know, immediate, if you have a water shutdown or elevators are down, that sort of thing, if you have this app on your phone, they can send notifications and it'll um, pop up on your, your phone. So I think those are, are good methods. Okay, I, have a, I have a question that says, insurance on buildings that are not on plans, uh, your insurance agent won't know if it's not, if this hasn't been, when you say they're not on plans, they're probably illegally built. And so you're saying, why are we insuring them? Because we probably don't know they're illegally built, but we do insure all that we see. So this person says, can I contact the city and county? Go for it, not a problem. Then she says, the common, or he says, a common wall neighbor builds a shed attached to their common wall. And did they have the right to do that? Again, building department, possibly, I'm not sure, but it's not an insurance question, but it, you're gonna have to see whether it is illegal or not for somebody to attach something to your wall or is that side their wall, I have no idea. That's what neighbors' disputes are all about. 
And uh, one other question said that, why can't the DNO insurance and other parts of insurance policy take the place of contractual liability coverage? The director, every policy covers certain things. It, it, you're, what you're, this person is asking is, they want one policy to cover something else that may be not on their policy. You can't make the property policy cover liability. You can't make the liability policy cover property. The DNO policy covers board decisions. Contractual liability is on your general liability policy if you have it and that's where it is. And that's the policy that's going to provide the coverage. If you don't have contractual liability on your general liability policy, there's no other policy that's going to step in to you for you on that issue. Okay, I've got the site for the aging in place. It's 514B-142. Okay, so it's 514B-142. It's the aging in place provision in the condo statute. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank all of you for uh, taking your time to join us this morning. Um, I'd also ask that you give the speakers a round of applause, please. If you haven't filled out the evaluations, would you please do so and leave them on the table on your way out. Thank you for coming.